this was a, a retrofit of an existing main street that as you can see, was not particular, particularly conducive to walking, biking, shopping, enjoying that center of the city. And uh, another, another well-known urbanist uh, design firm, Mullen Polyzoides, uh, provided this, uh, what we would call a highway to boulevard. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Mallory Batches, uh, president of CNU, the Congress for the New Urbanism. And Mallory's going to share with all of you <laughs> what CNU is all about and the upcoming meeting that is going to be happening in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Mallory. Enjoy. Mallory, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, uh, Mallory, I'd love to have my guests just to give a, a quick introduction. So, who is Mallory? <laughs> you bet. So, I'm Mallory Batches. I'm the president of CNU, Congress for the New Urbanism. Uh, I just took the helm with my co-lead, Margaret Gaddis, who's our executive director. Uh, we took the helm uh, as of January. And uh, so we're early into the role. Uh, I actually worked at CNU for three years from 2018 to 2021. I was the director of strategic development at the time. So this is coming back to an organization that I know, but also building on my background. I have a degree in architecture and a master's in sustainable urban development that it really, and, and, you know, 20 some years of urban design practice as well as a new urbanist. And so it's really sort of feels like a culmination of a lot of the experiences that I've had leading up to this moment. And now I'm excited to lead an organization that I was a dyed in the wool new urbanist. I became a member as soon as I graduated from college, uh, started working at Dewani Plater Cyberk and, you know, have been going to congresses and a part of this movement ever since. So it feels like coming home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I remember the very first day that you and I, uh, you know, had a chance to, to meet uh, out in, in your neck of the woods. And it was, uh, I believe it was on this day. <laughs> I think that might have been. John. I recall that day very clearly. Yep, that's me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's you, and and obviously that's that's Lynn there, our our um, a previous uh, leader from a few years back, and mm -hmm. um, that was a very special day uh, because that was the last time the Congress was you know there in, in the Carolinas, so to yeah. speak. <laughs> it yeah, was actually in Savannah, right. Georgia, but uh, uh -huh. we were in South Carolina at that moment. Yep, that's right. And I was actually living in South Carolina at the time. That that photo is from. Uh, a very early New Urbanist greenfield development called Habersham in Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, where I lived for uh, 16 years. And yeah. um, it was one of the very And there we are, early, we're rolling in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful place to live. It is both, you know, highly... Uh, surrounded by nature, has it has a you you feel very connected to your your environmental surroundings there. But it also is this you know little bastion of density in in an otherwise pretty rural part of the country. So it was a great place to live. It was a great place. I, I have a seventeen year old daughter. A great place to raise her. And uh, I, I remember that day exploring, touring, talking about. Uh, all of the, all of the lessons learned, uh, from Habersham, it was, I think the charrette for that project was in 1996. So it was, uh, it was one of the early examples and, and, and then y'all did that amazing bike ride on into Savannah where I live now. So yeah, that was a, that was a great, that was a great experience. I think one of the really interesting things to me about this part of the country and, Charlotte represents this to some extent as well as that it's it's an area that there's a lot of really interesting examples and precedents of what new urbanism has learned from and then also what you know examples of new urbanism itself and so uh, whether it was back in in at CNU 26 in Savannah or whether we're looking to CNU 31 in Charlotte here in a couple months I, I think it's a great place to learn about the principles that we all, design around. 
So speaking of which, let's let's dive into, you know, kind of what CNU is, what these principles are. Uh, regular listeners and viewers of the podcast here uh, at Active Towns hear me talk about or mention CNU in passing multiple times. <laughs> and uh, we've had, you know, Victor Dover on a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Lynn has been on the audio only version, uh, it, you know, once. Uh, Chuck Marone's been on the the, yeah. the video podcast multiple times. And and we, we mention it in passing. But why don't you take this uh, opportunity to kind of introduce the, the listeners and the viewers alike as to what CNU is? Yeah, absolutely. Well, for folks who don't know, we are a membership-based nonprofit, national scale. Uh, Our mission is to champion walkable, sustainable, equity-supportive urbanism. And our membership represents a broad, a very diverse set of professional practitioners, folks from the development industry, from the policy, uh, from the design industries. Uh, We have urban designers like, you know, my background, we have transportation engineers, we have uh, policy directors, municipal staff members, folks who actually are developers themselves, really runs the gamut of people who are invested in creating more walkable, more sustainable, more equitable communities around in their hometown and across the country. Fantastic. And I like to uh, try to make a comparison because when we say the term new urbanism, (laughs) uh, people sometimes get a little confused because when they look at it, they look at these visuals that we see here and they're like, well, wait a minute, that, that looks like the old stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Address that a little bit. How does that work? Well, so if you look back, the movement is, uh, is a, is a collective where we're celebrating and, and, CNU as an organization is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, founded in 1993. But the the movement really coalesced around the idea that at that era in time, development, real estate development was completely prioritizing automobile dependency and prioritizing single use land patterns. And the the founders of our movement, the early participants in this movement, look to historical examples of how cities had been built and were, as a result, more efficient, more walkable, more accessible, uh, created a better quality of life, and said, how can we learn from those examples and then apply that to new development and redevelopment in our cities and towns and and what you see over the course of the last 30 years is both a focused advocacy towards reinvesting in our center cities and also retrofitting our our land our our auto dependent land use suburbs and you know the challenges that we have taken on in 30 years 30 plus years have changed over time. There are there are areas where norbanism has really been successful in in moving the status quo, um, but there are also areas where we have a lot of work to do and where we have a lot of contribution to make. Much broader challenges that cities are facing that norbanism has a voice and a stake in. Yeah. And you said the magic words there in in terms of you know creating walkable, bikeable places. You know building places that people love. <laughs> and uh, we see here one of the ar- articles that uh, is, you know, uh, actually highlighted on the landing page here at the website. And yeah. again, this website is cnu.org, cnu.org. And, uh, and you know, quote unquote, debunking the 15 minute city <laughs> conspiracy that just popped up, uh, yep. you know, primarily driven by something that was happening over in the UK. But uh, the point being is that, yeah, I mean, these are traditional land development village uh, city patterns that emerged prior to the development of the automobile and the automobile coming in into into in, into play uh, and and other mobility things as well yeah. you know certainly you know streetcars and 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 trains you know had had the, its impact on habitation as well but yeah this concept of yeah you should be able to meet your daily needs by yeah. 
you know, being able to walk to uh, meaningful destinations. And that's the way we built our villages and towns, you know, for literally thousands of years until the automobile came along yeah. and then that sort of mi mixed things up. So, uh, yeah, I, I like to say when I when I try to explain to somebody what I mean by new urbanism, I'm like, <laughs> well, actually, you know, it's kind of like the way humans used to build villages, <laughs> traditional development patterns. So, That's right. That's yeah. right. Very true. Very true. Um, we, we, we sometimes laugh that, uh, you know, the, the process of naming what this movement is about is both very clear as to what we're attempting to, to impact and also sometimes leaves people a little confused as to what we're referencing. And so I appreciate the, the clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that we do uh, that adds some confusion is uh, the organization is called the Congress for the New Urbanism. <laughs> and when we get together, it's called a Congress. It's a Congress. <laughs> That's right. It is not a conference. It's a Congress. Um, that is very true. And, you know, the for folks who have been to a Congress, and particularly uh, folks who were at many of the early Congresses, and, and it, it's common practice in our, in our movement to talk about what was your first Congress, you know, sort of what was your indoctrination point, right? Um, when did, I can tell when you did mine. You, when was yours, John? I want to know. So mine was uh, West Palm Beach. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. A little uh, so over a decade ago. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mine was uh, mine was CNU nine, which would have been New York City, uh, which was sort of an outlier to have the Congress in, you know, one of the largest cities in the country. Um, right. We often find ourselves, you know, in a, in in cities like you know Savannah or Providence, Rhode Island, or um, well, gosh, we did de Denver. and we did Detroit. We did Detroit. We did and do Buffalo Detroit. too. So yeah, yeah. 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 As an organization, we try to move around the country, not just because it makes us more accessible uh, to different audiences and because it gives us, you know, different learning experiences, but because I think, you know, the geographies of this country lend themselves to both very general challenges and also really specific challenges. And so right. I think, you know, uh, it, it, it's a it's a benefit to going to different parts of the country and learning about what they're facing and, you know, trying to take those lessons home to wherever you live and work. Yeah. And we can see the pen marks here of mm -hmm. the past Congress locations. And uh, unfortunately I missed it when it was here in, in Austin. So <laughs> in that Austin, was, I remember that one. It was that, pre I think prior to my, uh, my, my discovering it, it might've even been just like the year before. I think uh, it really was or, or yeah. right around there, because I was going to say that my daughter, I think that was her first Congress. She's now yeah. 17 years old, but she, yeah. she came to that. Uh, we were, we were pushing her, her baby carriage around the, the streets of Austin for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And, it, and, and, and to highlight again, how, the locations get selected uh, as an attendee. My sense is that it's it's a place where uh, it may not be considered quote quote unquote the perfect place. You know, we, mm. we've got like Oklahoma City last year's mm -hmm. uh, a Congress mm -hmm. location as an example, but there's some sort of momentum. There's some sort of uh, local. Uh, examples of being yeah. able to point to. So like in the case of Oklahoma City, I had the opportunity to to shadow uh, Victor Dover doing a, a walking tour of the Wheeler District as a development that sort of looks at some of these concepts of yeah, sometimes there's going to be a redevelopment. Sometimes there's going to be a greenfield greenfield development, mm -hmm. and there's an opportunity to try to build in some of this traditional uh, development pattern in that location, and hopefully keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> it's within walking and biking distances to the uh, yep. the downtown area, which, by the way, the Wheeler District is walking it is. and biking, or it's not walk; it's biking distance. It's easy biking, biking distance. distance. For sure. it, it's and walking with, if you're intrepid, you know. Oh yeah, if you're intrepid, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so talk a little bit more about that sort of concept of, you know, these Congress locations yeah. being a, a nice platform for trying to exemplify and solidify what we're talking about in the Congress. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of Charlotte, our, our upcoming Congress, which is uh, May 31st to June 3rd this year. And, you know, Charlotte is a really interesting city to study uh, from an urbanist perspective. It's, uh, it's a city that, you know, as we have announced the Congress and, and begun talking about it, uh, a lot of folks have said to us, a lot of folks from other parts of the country have said to us, wow, you know, I'm excited to go see Charlotte because I've been to the airport many, many times passing through and I've never made it into the city. Charlotte is the 15th largest city in the country. Uh, I think it's the third largest, uh, third fastest growing metro area in the country. But it also has, and, and so, you know, because of that, it has a lot of immediate uh, examples of what is happening and how they are transforming that city. But it also has a great history of planning. It has uh, streetcar neighborhoods outside of you know its core downtown, immediately outside of its core downtown, uh, designed by John Nolan, famous uh, urban designer John Nolan. It has some Olmsted Brothers work, examples that folks can take a look at. It also has some very... Uh, some very early and and sort of the continuation to the present uh, examples of new urbanist work. Vermilion is a greenfield neighborhood in Huntersville, which is north of the city and was a very early uh, Dwani Plater Zyber, well known new urbanist firm. It's a very early DPZ greenfield development uh, design. And um, Burkdale Village is again north of the city. It's a it's a town center, a new town center that's that's been designed and developed now. All of these places are going to be part of the tours that we offer during the Congress, so folks can go out and you know really kick the tires on on these different examples, whether they're long term historic examples or you know more recent urbanist examples. But it also is a city that's working very hard on its immediate sort of uh, reinvestment. And uh, I'd love to talk about the theme of this Congress. We have a theme, um, we're, we're reinstating a, a theme for the Congresses. This was something that happened many years in the past and we're bringing it back because it gives us an opportunity to sort of focus on a problem space that many cities have and one that's you know, very immediate in our, in our local host city. And so Charlotte's theme is corridors. And if you know Charlotte, uh, it has these, these orthogonal boulevards, north, south, east, and west boulevards that extend out from the center of the city. And, uh, and, and sort of a, a longstanding uh, regional design pattern around corridors, corridors of movement, corridors of investment, corridors of, of uh, you know, transportation. And for us, it's an opportunity to look at that particular design element or that particular urban condition and focus on all of the multidisciplinary ways that our work touches corridors and the ways that we can, we can innovate in order to improve how corridors are developed and redeveloped. And so, you know, that, that opportunity to address a challenge that new urbanist practitioners face in a local host city is part of how we select where we're going to and part of how we frame the content that we're bringing to the Congress and the sort of discussions and sessions and workshops and experiences that we're providing folks that come to the Congress. Great, great. And for folks who might be wondering, uh, where the heck is uh, Charlotte? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what we're looking at here, you're, you're there in Savannah, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're going to be a little bit up. zooming in right here. <laughs> and and this is, is Charlotte. And uh, yeah, so super excited about uh, seeing this. This will be my first visit to Charlotte. This will be my first visit, I believe, to the state of North Carolina. So. Oh, really? Well, I, I, I'm excited to have you have you join us. I'm, I'm excited for any of your listeners that, you know, are joining us in Charlotte. This is we're obviously for for my co-lead, Margaret and myself. This is a really exciting opportunity. It's our first Congress to to lead the, the movement through. And we've put a lot of heart into uh, making this not just 
your typical, you know, panels and talking heads and, and listening until you get tired and have to leave the hotel conference center sort of experience, but really making it something where people leave the Congress feeling like they've been a part of exploring innovations, exploring solutions, exploring new toolkits that they can work on in their own practice or that they can partner with folks that they network with at the Congress in order to expand their practice. All of that sense of collaboration and creative problem solving, we're, we're putting an incredible amount of, of, of investment into and bringing this Congress back to what many of the many of our, our founders and, and fellows and early participants in the movement describe as just an incredible experience of, of excitement and feeling like you're a part of making change. And that's really something that's fundamental to being an urbanist is trying to change our cities for the better. So the Congress is our, our big first experience to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. And in getting back to the theme this year of corridors, um, I, I think it's important to, to to point out that, yes, I mean, whenever we're talking about human habitation and creating places, uh, mobility is an issue. And the fact that we've mentioned earlier that, you know, building on a car centric pattern really, you know, kind of influenced not only like where we were quote unquote building our habitation, yeah. Uh, yeah. but also what the habitation looked like. So when in looking, putting a visual to a corridor uh, yeah. situation, uh, we use this, uh, this particular image. I think this is Lancaster. Is that correct? It's Lancaster, California. That's right. Uh, this was a, a retrofit of an existing main street that, as you can see, was not particular, particularly conducive to walking, biking, shopping, enjoying that center of the city. And uh, another, another well-known urbanist uh, design firm, Mullen Polyzoides, uh, provided this, uh, what we would call a highway to boulevard. It's a, it's a conversion of a car-centric environment into a multimodal uh, into a more uh, pedestrian friendly, into a more enjoyable space to serve as the center of this town. Yeah. And I would even go so far as to say that this is, you mentioned highway, I would even go so, so far as to say this was a Strode conversion. <laughs> Yes, yes, so. yes. That for, for folks that don't know, a, a strode is, is when you have what should be a street, which is an urban condition that should allow for walking and biking and, and as well as vehicular movement, uh, but all of the modalities because it's, it's in an urban context and a road being out in a rural context where, uh, you know, the main movement is going to be higher speed vehicular movement. Uh, when those come together in a very Frankenstein fashion, New Urbanists, we like to, to call those strodes in, in somewhat uh, cheeky uh, appreciation for the fact that it may be the right thing somewhere else, but it's not the right thing in the middle of the city. Yeah, yeah. When when Chuck uh, coined the term Strode, he he called it the uh, the the hybrid, the mashup of the the road, the high speed, that highway design pattern with the street, which should be the platform for for building wealth, and it, it ends up yeah. becoming the futon of transportation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Doesn't work well at all because <laughs> you can't go fast, really, no, effectively. No. It's so it's no. not efficient and effective that way, and it certainly undermines the ability to create a sense of place, being yeah. able to provide that walkable, bikeable platform for vibrancy and vitality that we're trying to, to create here. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah. When you look at the challenge that uh, the organization has, uh, you know, looking forward, what are some of the things that you are thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, when, when Margaret and I took the helm, uh, our board empowered us to implement the strategic plan that CNU currently has. And a little background on that is that I was at CNU, as was Margaret, when this strategic plan was, was uh, drafted. It was uh, voted on by the board 
I believe the date, the exact date is uh, March 13th of 2020. Most folks will remember that week pretty clearly because that was really the last week before the COVID-19 pandemic became a, a change agent in all of our lives catastrophically. And as a result, like many nonprofits, uh, CNU pivoted to very different ways of delivering our Congress. Uh, delivering our programmatic work, delivering resources to our members. And as the organization has evolved since that point, it, we have found that the strategic plan's three pillars are just as relevant today as they were on that day, on that uh, last old way of doing things in 2020. The three pillars are legalizing walkable places and designing for a changing climate and supporting complete neighborhoods. And those three areas or, or sort of you know, focal points for CNU as an organization remain consistent with the challenges that we see cities are facing. We know that cities have land use regulations that inhibit the type of walkable, bikeable, sustainable, equity supportive urbanism that we're seeking. And municipalities have been attempting to reform those policies, but it's a big job. It's, it's difficult to take all of these different regulations, coordinate them in a way that ensures that the results will be a built environment that is comprehensively supportive of quality urbanism. There's a lot of work left to do. CNU has a long history of working in this space and will continue to do so, it, it, advancing existing programs that we have, like the Project for Code Reform, which works directly with municipalities to provide incremental bite-sized code edits that will help you know, sort of solve the biggest problems quickly. Uh, we also have our Highways to Boulevards program, which our, our main flagship product is the Freeways Without Futures report that we publish uh, every two years. The, the latest, the eighth edition of that will be coming out in April. And what that is, for folks who don't know, is a juried process of identifying existing urban freeways that are segregative, are underutilized, are damaging to the immediate urban environment. They separate neighborhoods, they separate economies, they uh, separate cities by race in many cases. And uh, the, the juried process identifies those freeways with the most potential and the most need to come down. And so that's another programmatic area. Uh, that's another area of work that you know we will continue uh, into the future. But there's there the other two pillars are areas where CNU is charting, in some ways, charting new territory. Um, you know, starting with climate, designing for a changing climate is both something that I would argue is embedded in the charter of. New Urbanism. The, 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 our charter is our sort of foundational document of 27 principles that underscore what it means to be walkable, sustainable, e equity supportive urbanism. And as you read through the, the principles of the charter, you, you see that the, the idea of designing for environmental sustainability is very much embedded in those principles. But most folks that think about climate change don't necessarily focus on the impact that the urban realm so comprehensively has on how environmentally sustainable, wherever you live, however you travel, wherever you work might be. And so CNU has opportunity to really hold a voice in the role that design can play in impacting our climate outcomes. That's, um, you know, that's something that we're starting to see at the federal level and in, in policy documentation, the, the decarbonization blueprint that the Biden-Harris administration released in January, sort of showing how the country can meet its, its decarbonization goals, outlines the role that land use planning has in meeting those goals, the very central role. And so CNU's task is to build programmatic 
outcomes to, to create tools and resources and support mechanisms to deliver the, the climate relevancy of urbanism. That's a big task. Um, and that's somewhere that, that Margaret and I will be putting a lot of focus towards with the help of you know, many of our members who are so much more knowledgeable than I would be in this space and know what works and doesn't work. Um, additionally, the, the support of complete neighborhoods really taps into something that we see across in cities across the country, which is that there, the affordability and accessibility of different neighborhoods in, in cities across the country is, is there's striking difference from one to the next. And what that really means, uh, you know, in, in plain words is that we need more housing. We need more housing closer to places people work or live or need services from. We need to ensure that that housing is connected to, uh, means of transportation, that they aren't car reliant, that we aren't pushing affordable housing to the outskirts of urban areas. And while the, you know, the, the, the housing in the center city, the cost skyrockets and is pricing out anyone who might otherwise work or want access to those, to those neighborhoods. And the being able to look at urbanism in a way that supports diversity of place, diversity of people, diversity of use, diversity of transportation, diversity of service, diversity of amenity, um, diversity of ages, diversity of ability. All of that uh, complexity is what makes highly effective, highly sustainable urbanism. And so another area of growth for CNU will be to help develop more tools to demonstrate what that looks like in policy form, what that looks like in built form, and and who has uh, gathering the folks who have the expertise to to help cities, help designers, help communities have uh, more diverse, more more complete neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to come back to to, to this image here, uh, which is actually. <laughs> As the Congress, we actually do have a charter. You mentioned it earlier. And so yeah. 30 years ago, this uh, charter came into place and it is a document. And in fact, there's a published document that goes into the details of uh, the charter of the Congress. And so uh, individuals can access that uh, online, I believe, as well, and be able to, to understand what these tenants are that are part of the Congress and part of the charter. And uh, we, we also see you, you were kind of walking through quite a few, uh, you know, aspects of, of the challenge that is ahead. And, and, and part of the challenge is that we've had decades of, you know, doing this. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the sprawl has not ceased. Despite the fact that uh, new urbanism has been, uh, you know, shouting from the rafters that uh, sprawling development is a problem for over 30 years, uh, the, the sprawl continues. You, you can look at any high growth city around the country. And I'm here in the southeast. The southeast is booming. And a lot of it is sprawling development just like this. And you know, I, I, I like to I like to refer people to the the introduction of the preamble of the charter that was, uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're coming on uh, 30 years of gathering around these principles. And the, the preamble begins the charter for the new urbanism views disinvestment in central cities, the spread of placeless sprawl increasing separation by race and income, environmental deterioration, loss of agricultural lands and wilderness, and the erosion of society's built heritage is one interrelated community building challenge. Those words are just as significant 30 years later, despite the success, the incredible legacy that the new urbanist practitioners have been able to produce in, in built example, there are still so many ways that cities are not meeting the the needs of their of their communities and are are not you know the the problems persist and so 
our work as an organization is to build off the legacy of successes that that our predecessors gave us, but to chart new territory that will make bigger impact, build more capacity for change, and you know implement a, a much broader level of reform than what we've seen to date. Yeah, and and build more of this this hellsca- <laughs> this hellscape. More. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's very hard. It's very hard to to understand why people wouldn't want to build more of this. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or this, a, mo- a more modern interpretation of, of, of what we're talking about. And, yeah. uh, and, 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 and here in Seaside in, in Florida, uh, a community that is built uh, around these tenants. And, and, and you had mentioned it before is dealing with the policies that make it illegal to do many of these things. Uh-huh. And uh, this is uh, in Pasadena. They're in the uh, the Los Angeles uh, area, and you also mentioned ha- being close to meaningful destinations, being close to and being able to access transit and regional transit. You get on the Gold Line right here in Pasadena, and you're down in downtown uh, Los Angeles in a heartbeat. And uh, and really, they Los Angeles is a great example of rebuilding and yeah. reestablishing what had been in place uh, prior to uh, the World War II and prior to, uh, you know, in the 1920s, it was thriving in terms of a streetcar rail network and communities such as uh, Pasadena, which, you know, developed as, as a bedroom community. And you, you had the ability to um, have walkable neighborhoods and uh, and I would say bikeable, too, because, by the way, they, they had a, a bike highway that, you know, Yep. was had been planned from <laughs> Pasadena to downtown Los Angeles. Um, but yeah. it was never really came to fruition, but, no, but it was a great <laughs> but idea. But it was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those examples that, you know, new urbanists as, as practitioners like to reach to, to say, look, this, these are ideas that, that people have had for a long time and that are practical and practicable. And so being able to, to show those examples and argue for them in, you know, current real time with the same problems existing in cities and the same needs for accessibility, for, for diverse accessibility, diverse modalities, diverse mobility. Um, you know, we like to do our homework. We're, we're, we're a group of folks that loves to uncover, you know, some example that's a hundred years old, but shows exactly the type of, 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 quality urbanism that we're promoting and you know somebody somebody else had a great idea we're just going to borrow it and we're going to show that it can happen in the here and now yeah yeah and and sometimes people question me and say well John, you're you're this public health guy uh, who's really thinking about uh, health in the built environment. What's the connection for you with with yeah. CNU? And I tell them, I say it's really all about that concept of reestablishing a development pattern that is inherently walkable and bikeable and embraces, you know, this, you know, this concept of we should be able to get around and meet our daily needs under our own steam and our own power. So even though in the early days, I was one of the only public health guys attending, uh, I've really found a home there and, uh, and, you know, I've sort of infiltrated maybe, (laughs) you know, into the scene and I am leading fun runs in, in Mm -hmm. the mornings of the, the Congress uh, each year and, uh, and do what I can to uh, turn my lens around uh, with the camera to try to celebrate uh, some of the wonderful things that each of the Congress host cities Mm -hmm. is, is pulling, you know, bringing forth and really trying to uh, tell that message and tell that story here on the Active Towns channel. And, and, and so that's it. That's, that's the reason why I'm so fascinated and obsessed uh, with CNU as a concept and as an organization and as a meeting, uh, an annual meeting. And it's yeah. my honor to, to do this every year for the, the Congress. We love it, John. It's you, as you know, and your your listeners might not. Uh, the the new urbanism is a is a rapt audience for for uh, you know the actively experiencing cities. We have 
we are a group of practitioners that like to impact the the built environment, the design of the built environment, but we're also people who really like to experience it. And, and we're people who make personal choices that relate to that, you know, that desire to experience cities in a, in an active, meaningful way. I, when I, I mentioned moving from the, the greenfield development of Habersham, which was itself very walkable and bikeable, but also outside of the city of Beaufort. And so was quite a long travel, usually done by car to into town when I moved to Savannah, I purposefully chose a, a a neighborhood where my daughter's walk to high school is six blocks. And, you know, that was, that was a personal choice, but also one that I realized as I was making it, that to many of my friends, it seemed somewhat radical that I was making a choice to live in a place so that I could, so that my daughter could walk to school, so that I could bike to essentially everything I want and need to do in this city. Um, and, and it reminds me that despite the, we, we sometimes talk about our founders as being radicals because what they were talking about 30 years ago was completely new to the conversation of how cities should, should grow and expand. And then I think about my own personal experiences here in 2023 and the choices I make and it still is a radical position to want to embrace cities from an active movement point of view and to really make your, your own choices about how you experience cities in that way. And I think the more people that are talking about not just the modalities, but the fact that the built environment informs the success of those modalities the, the more we're going to be able to impact change. And folks who, you know, from a public health perspective are taking walking and biking of cities seriously, then the design of cities inherently matters to the ability to walk and bike those cities. And so, you know, the new urbanists are here trying to, to offer our expertise towards that. Yeah. And it is, it's a, it's, it's a movement. It's, it's a meeting, a, a, an annual <laughs> gathering. Uh, and, uh-huh. And, yeah. and and I and I should mention too, you know, in looking at this, you know, snapshot from one of our our recent Congress meetings meetups, is that um, it's very multidisciplinary. It's it's not just all a meeting of planners or a meeting of transportation and mobility engineers or a meeting of public health officials. I mean, this is a that's what's to me makes it really really special. Is you see architects and designers and urban planners and, 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 uh, transportation officials and, and city officials, yep. uh, and advocates, of, yep. as well as, you know, people who are passionate about the environment, all mixing, you know, together. Yep. So it's all in, in, in intertwined and it's also a membership based organization. So yep. you can become a member <laughs> as well. <laughs> you can. Uh, we would welcome you to become a member of CNU. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and it's not ridiculously priced. I mean, an annual membership is just $195 uh, per year as an urbanist. There is a discount urbanist uh, you know, for available for government and nonprofit uh, organizations and professionals as well as uh, whoops, get come back here. Come back. Don't go away too soon. <laughs> as well as an opportunity for, you know, uh, advocates as well as uh, student membership as well. So there's it, they really the organization you all have really um, tried to reduce the barriers to entry, yep. encourage as many people as possible and make the tent as as broad and wide reaching as possible. Yeah, that's right. We 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 are only as strong as the energy and knowledge and excitement of our membership. And, you know, we recognize that and try to make as many inroads for folks to, to experience the, the knowledge sharing that, that new urbanists are, are so known for, Um, you know, thinking about the upcoming Congress, we have uh, on the Congress registration page for folks who the, the cost of registration is prohibitive. We have opportunity for scholarships that, um, that we make available to make sure that folks who want to be a part of these conversations are able to access them. 
Um, and, you know, as you flip through, we have our, our online journal, which is Public Square. Uh, that is can be found on our website. It has a lot of amazing content, uh, both written by our senior communications director, Rob Studeville, who's been a part of the movement from the beginning, um, but also from folks doing op-eds, you know, talking about their work, talking about challenges they're facing uh, as well. And then we do On the Park Bench, which is our, our uh, webinar series. And the topics for that coming, you know, all across disciplines, all across experiences, and um, and those are those are accessible on the website as well. You can watch, you know, sign up for upcoming webinars and also watch past ones. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the one of the things I have heard from folks that are new to neurobinism is that they find some point of entry that relates to either their local situation or their practice, their, their work experience, their recreation experience. And, you know, some aspect of their life brings them to neurobinism, but what it opens for them is a platform of so many folks who share very similar values to them and bring all kinds of different expertise to those shared values. We, we like to talk about the Congress as being the, the, the big, big, crazy family reunion. Uh, we, many of us have known each other for a long time, but we get really excited that, that new energy, new voices, new experiences come to the table because that's how we all learn. You know, I've, I've heard some of these founders stories before, you know, but I love to hear someone who's explaining to me about an initiative they're working on to, you know, convert a rail trail uh, into a, into a multimodal path so that their their neighborhood has better access to resources a neighborhood over. That's those are the kinds of stories that I get really excited about because it's the the practical implications of those twenty seven principles that that we all gather around. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it, Mallory. Yes. Any final thoughts? Well, uh, I think I would I would just share with your listeners that, um, you know, one of the exciting things about my tenure coming to uh, to the helm of CNU is I sort of learned at the at the you know skirts, as they say, of, of many of our founders. And so I I have been talking about the fact that Margaret and I, we are we are similar in age. Uh, in our in our midlife, mid career, we are the next generation of neurobinists, and so um, one of the things that really excites me is to find new, interesting audiences to connect this movement with. You know, as a designer by practice, I know the design field to some extent. I still have a lot to learn, um, but, but I'm excited for new audiences and new energy and new interest and, and where this movement is going to go in the next 30 years. And so, you know, I think I would leave your, your listeners with the, the, uh, the invitation to come learn about neurobinism, connect with me. You can literally find my email address right there on the website and uh, reach out to me and tell me about what you are experiencing in the built environment and how CNU could help make your active town uh, a little, a little more accessible, a little better uh, urbanism. Yeah. And I popped over to the staff page so that you could, uh, we could get a, a, a visual here on Margaret as well. Shout out for Margaret. Uh, yeah. Shout out for Margaret. Uh, <laughs> we talk, love talk, Margaret. Talk a little bit about that, um, that co-leadership uh, structure that yeah. uh, you guys have uh, migrated and evolved into uh, this past year. You bet. So, uh, so CNU has had a history of, uh, of, of folks at the helm. And with this transition, what the board acknowledged was that in order for the organization to really build capacity, we both need someone who is sort of an outward facing leader, and that would be me, uh, who, whose role it is to uh, direct the vision of the organization and communicate about that vision to our audiences around the country. And, and likewise, 
in order to build capacity, we needed a, a an internal focused leader who would grow the capacity of the organization itself, grow our staff, grow our programs, grow our tools and, and uh, communication platforms in ways that can better serve our membership and better serve our chapters as well. I should note that we have chapters all across the country uh, that do local work, uh, gather locally, advocate for local initiatives, uh, you know, network locally, support each other and each other's uh, work. And so the, the dual leadership allows Margaret to focus on those internal aspects of growing the movement and allows me to focus on the external aspects of growing the movement. And, you know, I, we, we worked together previously. We are good friends in addition to uh, having extraordinary respect for each other. She has a wealth of background in nonprofit, uh, in program management and in nonprofit capacity building. Uh, I bring the knowledge of having worked with a lot of new urbanists all over the country over the years. And so together we really complement each other and we have fun uh, working together as well. Yeah, yeah. And I was telling her just the other day on the phone uh, that, you know, it was it was so cool to see uh, her help bring the Congress back last year, because there was a couple years of we had to have a pause because of the yep. pandemic. So Oklahoma City, uh, seeing you 30, that was a huge uh, accomplishment. And uh, and she really, you know, was instrumental in pulling that together, along with obviously the 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 um, incredible team uh, of the host city, which is yeah. a big part of it. And again, I want to give a huge shout out and and, um, and and really encourage everybody, if you are able to attend this coming May 31st to June 3rd, uh, please make this your first Congress. I, I promise <laughs> it won't be your last. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, we, we are known for having return customers. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great. And come join me for a, a little fun run. Uh, we're actually yeah. going to do it on Thursday, Friday and Saturday this year. And then, uh, we'll be out on the bike doing some filming too. Uh, Mallory, thank you so very much for joining me on the active towns podcast. Thank you for having me, John. It's been a delight. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mallory. And if you did, please <laughs> give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And hopefully you'll be able to attend CNU. I'd love to see you there. <laughs> I'll be uh, obviously shooting some video and leading uh, some fun runs on Thursday, Friday and Saturday morning. And uh, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below. Be sure to ring the notifications bell right next to it so that you can customize your notification preference, preferences, 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 your notification preferences. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Uh, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And if you are really enjoying this content, please consider becoming a patron, uh, helping support my efforts to bring this content to you each week. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>